Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk with Rosa Nade Garmandia. Thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Colette Mello, and I will be moderating today's conversation with Rosa. This event is being recorded, so please take this opportunity to turn off your video if you do not want to participate in this recording. FIU Miami Beach Urban Studios, known as MBUS, is an incubator for the arts, architecture, music, design, and communication. I'd like to take this, uh, I'd like to thank Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these talks and for their continued support during these topsy-turvy times. Mm -hmm. The format of this art talk will start with Rosa giving a presentation about her work, and then we'll have a conversation which will be open to questions through the chat function. Rosa Nade Garmandia is a socially engaged, multidisciplinary artist who produces work at the nexus of contemporary art and activism. Her work is rooted in social issues. Her process is investigation using art as a tool, as an inquiry and critique of society stemming from the intersectionality of her identity as a woman, immigrant, and industrial worker. She is a recipient of the Wavemaker Grant, Artist Access Grant, Ellie's Creator Award, and Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator Grantee and Artist Fellowship. She has pursued her studies at the University of South Florida, Parsons School of Design, and the University of Miami. She has participated in cultural exchanges, artist residencies and exhibition programs throughout the Caribbean and the United States. Currently, she's a teaching artist at PAM. I believe you were there when it was MAM as well, right, Rosa? Hi, Rosa, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you. I'm gonna hand the screen over to you now. Okay, great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen first um, so I can get situated. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the Miami Beach Urban Studio Zoom Art Talk Series and Colette Mello for giving me this virtual platform to talk a little bit about myself and about my art practice. It's been five weeks since George Floyd was killed by police and we've seen multi-ethnic um, huge protests and demonstration across the nation and actually across the world and today we're also going into the 16th week of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So definitely these are very uh, unique times for all of us. Um, so um, I wanna share my pronouns, uh, which are she, her, and hers. And before I continue, I also want to um, recognize the land that I live and work on which is the traditional land of the Tequesta, the first peoples of the region uh, here in South Florida, especially because of what's happening uh, today. As, um, as I was introduced, my name is Rosa Nalai Garmendia. I am originally from Havana, Cuba, and I live and work in Miami. I wanna tell you a little bit about myself and how I got to where I am. I. Uh, I have a, a quote here by Maya, Maya Angelou because I think that um, knowing where you come from is very, very important uh, process um, that helps you figure out um, what to do and where you're going. Um, my life and my pra art practice for the most part have been a practice in, con in a continuous exercise of searching for my identity. That is particularly important for someone like me who, um, who was transplanted, uprooted from uh, my broad family, from my native culture at a very young age. I think that a uh, shared culture and shared history and ancestry that um, folks who haven't been able, who haven't migrated and, and who are accustomed to generations and generations to have this intact is very different for immigrants um, because your life becomes a process of excavating, of searching, of looking for, for who you are and where you come from. Um, this construction for me, this construction of identity uh, continues. It's never, it doesn't end. It's a bit complex. Um, when I was uh, 
in school uh, during my master's, uh, when I was getting my master's degree, two things happened that uh, really affected me. One was that uh, Dick Gregory came to campus to speak. He's, uh, he's passed now, but he is, uh, was a comedian and an activist, a civil rights activist and protested against the Vietnam War. I went to hear him speak on campus and I remember being very overwhelmed and very shocked and uh, by the things he had to say about racism. Um, the second thing that happened to me while I was in art school, um, getting my master's is that I applied for a Peace Corps over the summer and I was rejected because I wasn't a US citizen. So with those two events, they kind of pushed me away from art school and I decided to go around uh, different cities in the Northeast and the North, uh, the Southwest and work my way through um, just work and, and, and learn um, different states in the Midwest. I worked in construction. I worked as a meat packer in Detroit um, I pushed back planes here in Miami airport. Um, I worked in sewing factories in New York and Miami. And actually my very first police brutality um, protest was in Minneapolis when I was there. I was there six months and it was very cold. So I decided I would, um, I would leave there. So I'm sharing with you some images because I, of things that I've been involved in because I'm an I'm an activist uh, and an artist. And for a very long time, those two things were separated. And it wasn't until um, Michael Brown was uh, shot and killed that I started to question my role as an artist. Um, so as uh, Colette explained earlier, I'm a socially engaged artist. I I think activism is very important. I'm an immigrant, a woman, and an industrial worker. Uh, I'm committed to creativity and social change through my art practice. I consider my uh, artistic practice a daily act of resistance. And we can talk a little bit about that later if you're curious. And I use art as a tool to engage folks in conversation, in conversations of um, issues that are important to me. My experience of otherness, resilience, and conflict have made it possible for me to identify with cross-cultural social issues. Um, I want to focus um, today on one particular body of work, um, a particular project that I've been working on for the last six years. Um, and I, I explained earlier, I mentioned that uh, Rituals of Commemorations is a project I started Really the evening that Michael Brown was killed in August, I was actually driving home from my studio at the time at the Art Center South Florida, Light Arts Now. Um, and I was very upset and um, just troubled by the facts and what I heard on the radio. And it was a defining moment for, for me. At this time, I decided that I would no longer keep my, I, my, my separate parts of myself, my activist self and my, um, my artist self separated and that I would um, leave, live more wholly, more integrated. Um, and so I began um, to work on this project. So um, first I want to talk a little bit about the research part of the project um, because it's really, um, it's a crucial part of the project and it's very time consuming. And as an artist, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a historian, though I am interested in all those things. I'm not a politician, but I'm interested in politics. Um, research is, um, for this project has been really a new, uh, a new uh, sphere for me of work. And I, I think it's very, very um, important. You know, it's an examination, it takes time, um, there's a lot of comparison. Uh, I use databases uh, online, um, newspapers, articles. There's a lot of cross-checking of facts. I'm interested in the facts. You know, when you, when you read in an article uh, information where the family has been interviewed, where witnesses are explaining what they saw versus what the police version of things are, the autopsy report, 
until now, um, the most comprehensive database that I have found is actually the, the Washington Post, which you actually have to subscribe to and pay in order to get. Um, so I spend a lot of time uh, analyzing, researching, because I think the facts are important, and especially not only the facts, but who's telling the facts, right? Because there's the saying, two sides of every story. Well, there's not only two sides, there are multiple sides to every story. And it really depends where you're situated and how you interpret uh, facts or what is happening. Um, I think that um, my research is important to me because it helps me and I, ha I hope it helps others um, to have information that, I, that we need um, about the human beings that were killed and how they were killed and why they were killed. I hope that the research um, challenges the generalized acceptance that black lives don't matter, that it's okay to be killed by the police in the streets, in the park, in the parking lot, in your own home, in a car, um, in the afternoon, in the morning, at night. Uh, you know, there's just so many uh, concrete uh, circumstances. Um, I think there's a, there's a systematic neglect by the systems of power um, in this country that, you know, that are being addressed, actually. Um, the research that I've been doing until December of 2019, I've been able to record uh, 1,293 lives lost. Um, and I began actually 19, uh, with the information around 1979. Uh, many of you who lived in the city know about um, what happened to McDuffie. Um, and I was young, I was a kid when that happened. I lived in the other, I live in North Miami now, but I used to live in Southwest uh, by the airport when that happened. Um, so with that, um, this project, Rituals of Commemorations, um, documents um, black lives of men, women, and youth that have been killed by police in the United States and its territories. Uh, the research includes national databases, newspaper articles, um, writings by scholars. I do a lot of research just on uh, specific black history. Um, there's a lot of cross-checking involved. I organize the information by years and um, by different, and right now it's at different stages um, because it's a lot of work. And I also have a full-time job as a teaching artist. Um, so I'm not a full-time artist yet. You know, and it's a daunting, overwhelming task. And I balance the task of researching about um, what happened to these people with um, the actual process of the, of the physical uh, or the object part of the artwork. So um, I inscribed the names and the dates on each brick. I decided to, to use bricks, even though this was not my first choice. And we can talk about that um, later. Uh, there's a process of aligning um, each name, each letter, carefully and diligently making sure that I lay out the entire name. Nathiel Harris Pickett, for example, if it, you know, if it doesn't fit on the brick, I have to make sure that the middle name, the initial is included. Um, I sometimes get confused because I've already inscribed the name of Jerome or Jamal or Terrence, but it's a different Terrence, a different Clark, a different Jamal. So um, I have to keep uh, double checking and cross-referencing, and especially because I work, you know, at different times of day, uh, not always at the same time. Sometimes three days will pass by and I can't uh, work uh, in my studio. I, choose, uh, I chose Helvetica as the font because Helvetica is a sans serif font and it's straightforward in its appearance. It's easy to read. Um, I usually lay out four or five bricks before I head outside and uh, spray paint and begin the process of dress distressing the bricks. Mm. Rosa, how many bricks do you have made so far? So today there's an installation that's being hung right now. It's 495 uh, bricks, um, but so it's very short of, um, of the entire uh, number. Um, so, yeah. And so when you do the research, it sounds like the research is more important than the actual brick. The brick is just, or is it 
just as important to you? Well, as an artist, um, the most important aspect for, as an artist, so the artwork is important, but in order to carry out the artwork, I have to research. It's a very important part of it. So, I mean, the object, the conversation and the mm -hmm. object are very important. And especially because I'm an artist, I'm not, uh, I'm not a journalist, I'm not a historian. Um, the current in iteration includes 500. They're actually paved stone bricks and um, you, know, you get them at Home Depot. They're easy to transform by painting. There's layering involved, um, weathering of the bricks involved also. Um, the concrete is, you know, it's a little bit like a, I think of it as Duchamp. If it already exists, I'm just transforming it. I'm not a ceramic artist. So I'm at the stage I began this project, I wasn't interested in making my own brick. I'm interested really in, in the names and the idea of what is happening and getting to that, um, you know, in a timely manner. Um, and the, the works, the installations have taken different um, shapes and iteration. Uh, they began as walls. Um, you can see on the left in 2014, um, trying out different types of bricks, different ways of painting the bricks. Um, and it started off as walls. And as they've been shown in different places and as the conversation nationally has changed, they've become, um, the installations have changed and grown. Uh, for example, in some uh, iterations, I've used a, a monitor with some pictures and facts of um, the atrocity and the killing. Um, in some uh, other um, installations, uh, it changed from a wall to, to columns. And the reason that, it, that I did that is because um, the conversation around the wall that divides the United States and Mexico became really intense for a while. And I really didn't want to uh, build walls. I'm interested in, in commemorating and remembering lives lost and the way that they were lost, not in building, I'm interested in building bridges, not walls. So the, the, the installations um, changed. Um, right now, uh, actually, so they change all the time. And it's an opportunity for me to, to learn every time the exhibition, uh, every time the, the installation goes to a different place. When I'm able to visit uh, and go along with the work, I, I learn a lot because I can engage folks in conversation. Um, when the installation travels without my being able to be there, then I, I'm not able to, to, be, to be present and have conversations with people. For example, one of the things I learned during in the course of sharing this work is that if folks were not um, following what's happening, they didn't recognize the name because it's only a few names that get um, media attention, not the totality of, uh, of the, the victims. This image um, is from an installation that just closed, uh, an exhibition that just closed in March of this year, Intersectionality, the Asper Art from the Creole City. It was a uh, part of 25 artists from 17 countries that explored identity and intersectionality. Um, it was curated by Rosie Gordon Wallace and Saint Senjit Stethi, and it was at the Corcoran, Corcoran Gallery in Washington, DC. During the pandemic, I've been, um, you know, I, I'm continuing to, to work actually uh, I was researching the Washington Post uh, a couple of weeks ago. And from January, 2020 to the present, uh, where, what is today, June 28th, 29th? Um, there's been 1,298 black men, women, and youth killed by police. I haven't begun to do that research yet. Um, there've been times that I've had people help me uh, do some of the research because it's such a time consuming endeavor. Uh, so this is a, a little bit of, uh, I've been working with a, a, a local artist, Julian Pardo, and he's been helping me engineer the columns because um, so they could be taller and they can really, when, when I think about like in 2015, 279 lives uh, lost. Well, in one column to have 279 buildings as an engineering aspect of it. So we're working out um, how to build the, the columns without using concrete so that they can be installed and deinstalled. Um, 
especially because uh, the the work is traveling right now as we speak is actually being installed at the Harvey B. Uh, Knack Center for African American Arts and Culture in North Carolina. Um, and it's going to be opening in, in September, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so is this part of the same exhibition that's traveling or this is just your work It's traveling? No, it's, a, it's the same exhibition. Oh, great. Right. Five artists from the Caribbean or related to the Caribbean and, and the Caribbean diaspora. So it's the same exhibition that's traveling uh, to different places. Yes. Well, hopefully it will come down here. Uh, yeah, that would be fabulous. I also yeah. wanted to take a little time to talk about some of the artists that, um, you know, that I look at, that I follow, that I study. Um, so Marcel Duchamp, you know, is like the father of contemporary art. Um, he opened up the door for everyone to do, I think, whatever they want, almost, or it just really opened up the door for artists and the arts. I'm also, um, I'm also influenced and I, uh, I've been looking at uh, for years since I was in art school at Dada or Dadaism as a movement. And, um, you know, they were, it, it included uh, the visual arts, literature, theater, um, graphic design. Um, the Dada is concentrated on anti-war politics and anti-bourgeoisie, uh, they, they did protests. They did, um, they published journals. Um, so that, um, and they were affiliated with the radical left um, of the time. So that's um, some artists that I've looked at um, at different times in, in my life. Um, I also um, studied and looked at Mexican muralists. Um, I lived in Detroit for a while. Um, Diego Rivera, Orozco, Cisqueros, you know, and um, just murals and the, I'm attracted to murals being accessible and open to the public. People don't have to go to a museum, a gallery, um, they can paint. And these artists, uh, you know, painted about social issues um, of the time. So murals and muralists um, I've been looking at for a long time. I think you mentioned earlier um, that I'm a teaching artist at the Perez Museum, uh, what used to be the Miami Art Museum. So I've been working there for about hmm, a long time now, like 10 years. And it's really been a fabulous experience for me and it feeds my, my personal artistic practice. It's like going to school every day. So other than making art, the, the thing that I love most is being in an environment surrounded by contemporary art and having the opportunity to read, to research, um, and then to share the, the art works of art that I'm passionate about, that I like, um, which many of them are in the collection uh, with other people, with young people, with kids, um, with homeless folks, with um, you know the general population in, in Miami. Uh, one of the artists that I discovered while I was at PAM was Doris Salcedo, Colombian artist that you may be familiar with, some of you. And, um, you know, her work is deeply rooted in the, the conflict um, in the country where she's from in Colombia. And I remember the first time I saw um, Atavidiarios, the shoes um, embedded on the wall, I was like blown away. Um, it was, here. Yeah, so, uh, it was a very powerful exhibition at PAM. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Incredible work and very poetic. And it's just, uh, she is an incredible artist. You know, I, um, as an artist, I think for me, but I think artists in general, we're like almost like doctors. You have to keep abreast of what's happening. You have to, so I make it a point not only to, um, to study um, the artists where I work that are shown at, at PAM, but also around the city. Um, so uh, recently, uh, MOCA had, uh, an exhibition after Cobra. So I was familiar with some artists there, but I, I was familiar with all of them. So the, this was part of a black arts movement in the United States in the 1960s. Um, so, you know, artists um, like that, I'm interested in, and I look uh, at, I also look at uh, contemporary Cuban artists on the island. So there's really a lot as a teaching artist. I, I mean, there's so many artists I look at and influence. What I like the most is when an artist um, 
visually um, talks about issues in a new way that I haven't seen before, that I haven't been confronted in particular ways. And many contemporary artists do that. So, uh, so I mean, it's really, I'm very happy to have that job, uh, but I also would be happier, I think, if I was able to, to have my practice and just live off my practice. But um, so um, when I first started this project, it was very difficult. Uh, you know, you, you as, a, as an, an artist who works, you know, you have your wages that are limited. You use your wages for living, for paying rent, for buying groceries, for putting gas in your car. So I was very limited in what I can use to, um, to, to the money I could use for my practice. Um, and a few years ago, I started to apply for grants and actually get some grants that have helped me quite a great deal to be able to move this work forward and to continue to work. And you mentioned some of those um, earlier, uh, Colette. Also, you know, um, you also mentioned uh, Rosie Gordon Wallace and the Asper Bi Cultural Arts Incubator um, that I also want to mention because when uh, no one else was really um, looking at this work a few years ago or didn't think this work was valuable, uh, Rosie was uh, supporting this work uh, and supporting me as an artist. And, you know, that's very important to me. So I wanted um, to share that. Um, Wasn't Rosie also recently involved in a food drive for artists? Oh yeah, she's very, she's very active on many many fronts. Yes, connecting uh, uh, farmers in the homestead with artists. Uh, it happens every two weeks, and you can go to the website and and check that out uh, and sign up for a box of um, vegetables and fruits. Yes, that'll be taken. Really through. great. I'm, I was so happy when I saw that. I was like, oh, Rosie is so great. So I'm a and, um, I just kind of want to end um, with uh, this project for me. Um, I, I'm, I was in, I'm in, I started the project as a way to get into conversation through art about a, this topic of police brutality and the systematic racism racism that promotes inequality, poverty, the school to prison um, pipeline, the role of police, military intervention abroad. And, um, and now uh, everything has shifted because now you almost have to live under a rock to not know about um, what is happening around this particular issue. But it's really my fundamental belief in justice that fuels my desire to use art to use these markers as permanent tombstones that meaningfully mark the lives lost. And I think that this project will continue to provoke conversation, hold memory and interrogate um, all of our um, unconscious biases. And I wanna end with just uh, asking folks to find ways that um, you can do and have your own role um, in this struggle. So with that, I'll end and thank you. Thank you for a fabulous presentation. So one of the things you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I thought maybe you could expand a, a little bit. Um, you mentioned you, um, you had this moment with the Michael Brown when you were driving in your car listening to NPR and you, and you heard that um, he was murdered. Um, what, and then you decided you were going to make your, your activism was going to be part of your artwork. You were going to be holistic. What were you, what kind of artwork were you making before that? What were you doing? Um, and how has your, your um, practice evolved through the years? So before that, um, you know, I was trained as a painter and I stopped making art for a while. When I left, um, I, I left school and I, uh, I worked and got involved in uh, activism around union issues, police brutality, and then I, I came back to art making again after some years. And previous to this, I was, I've always been uh, interested and concerned about society. And, and one of the reasons I left art school or when I was getting my master's is because there was a large, there was a huge gap between uh, folks that consume art 
artists for the most part and society as a whole. And I was, I, I was, I was like, okay, I'm done with that. I want to do something relevant, something that affects people that helps to change society. And I didn't see it, that art could do that at the time. So I, when I started to come back and, and make work, I, um, I was accepted at the Florida, um, what is now ULITES. And I think, um, you know, the, the 2010, 2012, you know, there was uh, 2012, um, uh, I'm sorry, there was a really big, uh, and I forget his name now, how can I forget? It's just too many names. In 2012, Trayvon Martin was killed. Mm -hmm. um, and 2014, Eric Gardner, there was a lot of uh, military intervention abroad uh, happening. And the work I was doing at the time was uh, talking about those issues, but in a very abstract way. I, at the time, um, I, I was able, I had the opportunity to work with um, um, the Art South Florida. They have a whole uh, public sort of Walgreens uh, projects. And I was able to make wall, uh, make work for the for the Walgreens windows, which was great because then people didn't have to come into the gallery, didn't have to come into a, a, an artistic space. So it allowed me to engage folks in conversation in a different way about uh, with art. And I think that had an impact also on on this. So it, you know, um, there isn't one linear thing. I think this the it's the sum of experiences and particular moments in life that push you in directions to do different things anyway for me. So, you know, also in 2012, I had the opportunity to be part of a international uh, mural biennial in Santiago de Cuba. Um, and that was an amazing experience. I was there for a month. There were artists from 48, 15 different countries, six different languages spoken. And so we did murals and it was just a, so, then when Michael Brown happens, it was just a bit too much. And it was like, okay, that's it. What am I going to do? And as an artist, this, this is what I decided to do, to use art as a tool to engage folks in conversation. And I do other projects. This is one in particular that I'm very um, focused on and that take a lot of time, but that I'm committed to. And it's just, a, and I'm happy that the conversations are much broader now. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you did. Yeah, I was interested also. So when you're changing your practice like that, you're, you're a painter, what was your subject matter? What were you painting? Um, for example, I was using, I was working with a lot of text. Okay. I, right before the uh, two years before. So um, mixed media, uh, cutting out huge letters and always with a message, but it was more, um, more about the aesthetics than the message. And now it's more about the message. If I, if I have to put it in a balance, the message is very important. And then I find ways aesthetically to tell the message in a visual way. So before the aesthetics had more weight, um, I was working with text in many different ways. Uh, uh, for example, I had a, um, a, a piece, one of the works in, in the Walgreens window was uh, cutouts, three-dimensional cutouts with um, cardboard that sort of said, what next? And it was really a way to, you know, people make people, as they walk, they were very, um, how would I say? They were very, uh, you know, they're three-dimensional, very uh, painterly and sculptural, and they were large. And I, what I wanted to do with that piece is uh, provoke people into thinking about the things that were happening. Uh, and what would be their response and what are they going to do? But in a very subtle, so you could have applied, it was very open to whatever you wanted. What next? No, I'm going to go cook. What, but now the work is very focused and very specific and very much in your face, I think. So in during this, so going down the saying where your practices changed, you were selling art before. So now I'm assuming it's a little bit harder to sell bricks and I know you so you, you have to part of your practice is you you need to apply for these residencies these grants to help your practice move forward you can't because I it, is that correct or am I wrong here um yes for the most part I mean I'm not in, I'm not a I'm not in the how can I say this 
I'm not in the um, in the rut of where artists are forced to make objects in order to sell, in order to to live off their work. So, because the only tool you have as an artist, I, I I see myself as a as a worker. I produce art and culture, and I need to be paid because I need to I need to live. But um, so there's always this push. How are you going to do that? So with this type of work, which is about whose objective is totally different, um, the grants is a is a way that I can do that. But also there's a there's a a, a community in Miami um, that I've met through Diaspora Vibe and and outside of Miami that um, that supports my work. So um, I'll make a I'll do a little fundraiser and I'll if someone donates some money towards a particular project, I will give them a brick or a, a drawing or a photograph. So sort of a more of a barter system. Um, and so I've done that quite a bit in order to help fund um, the production of work. But the grants have been very helpful because it just, um, you know, without resources, you can't like, just like the studio space, you know, without, right. a, without a place to work. I live in an apartment. How are you going to produce? And the grants that I've gotten in the last three years have enable me to dream larger, to make uh, drawings, to pay other folks to uh, to create a 3D drawing for me that I you know, cannot produce, but I have the idea uh, to make, to fabricate objects that might work in a public installation. Now, in the last couple of years, some of these grants have been to research the idea and the place to make a permanent monument or what we, discussed today a counter monument to the lives lost so nice uh, so grants are really helpful in that in that because they give me the resources to to begin that process right i have a couple questions through the chat i have um rosa can you talk some more about ways you had the general public to walk in the shoes of the victims and experiencer lived realities um well, I think um, particular uh, examples are, you know, people come up to the to an installation and they start to look at the names. And so who are these names? What are they? So if they're curious folks, they have to research or they might recognize the name. Oh, so this is about uh, this. And I know I've had um, family and close friends whose, um, whose ideas on the issue of police brutality have changed in the last six years. And it's not only who, I, when I start, first started doing this work, it's like, why are you doing this? You should be doing your other work and try to sell and go in that direction. You know, this is not gonna get you anywhere. What, why? So, but you know, um, so there's been a shift and it's a slow shift. So uh, when I was in DC at the, exhibition that just closed, I was able to talk to people. I was standing around the work and talk to people from all walks of life, DC people from Africa, African students, people who came from out of the city. And um, then you also engage people who have been looking at this problem, people who are studying, people who are, um, you know, who are aware. So you get to, you find fellow folks who are interested in this, who think this is a, an important issue. And mind you, this is all before a month ago, because now things have shifted. Now things are different. Now we're forced to look at the social issue in a way that did not happen in my lifetime at, at this scale. Yes. Now, I don't know if I answered that. No. Um, we have another question. How have your... Okay, wait. Okay, no. I have another one after this one. So what... What are the one or two pieces of advice you would give to young activist artists just starting their career about the struggle between making art, making a living, making art, and how you can do both? How can you do one, do both? Yeah. You know, that's, the, that's, that's an ongoing uh, challenge, I think, for all artists. You know, you have to decide what you want to do, what you have to do for yourself as an artist and as a human being. And sometimes that's a... It takes time. I have very good friends that are very talented friends that I envy, but it's a good envy who from a very young age have been very focused 
I had not been very focused. And I think it has to do with my own personal um, experience of, of immigration and uprootment that I'd have had to rediscover and refine myself and what I need to do. So first of all, you have to find, you really have to find what you want to do. If you want to make art to sell, and this is, then that's fine. Then you figure out how to do that. If that's your objective. If, um, I personally think that um, artists should have like a wage, um, you know. No, I believe in that. $50 yeah. an hour. I don't, I don't need a lot of money to live. $50, and then I make what I make. And, you know, if you sell it or someone else sells it, or I just produce, my job is to think, to, pr to be engaged and to produce conversation and affect society through my artwork. And I can get, you know, I can make $50. $50 an hour would be a good wage for me. I can live decently. But you know this so for me that would but that's not what we have so i think everybody has to everyone has to, has to make their own road and that's difficult i think um, well like you were saying earlier i mean you're you you're definitely looking for grants residencies you you're in the community so you have a community of people so i think that's important for young artists to you know be out there and looking for the opportunities you know, um, I have another question. Let's see. You spoke about using bricks. Do you paint the names on other objects as well? Uh, no, uh, not for this particular project. Um, this project started as a coin project, actually, a, a coin design um, inspired by the fifty by the dollar coin, the U.S. dollar coin, and in the front of it had uh, an image of. For example, the first one I did was Michael Brown. And on the back, it would have an image of the country that United States intervened in military during the same time. And it's a conversation about police brutality and military intervention and how they are part of the same thing in my eyes. So, you know, to make a coin was like a lot of money. So I could not do that. I, did, I could not afford it. So I looked for other ways to engage folks, something that was easier for me to do. And and that I could do and not spend a lot of, um, you know, that wouldn't take me a long time and I wouldn't need a lot of money. And I looked at, you know, how culturally in the United States, bricks are used, name bricks. You go to a hospital, there's a name brick for a donor. You go to a museum, you go to a school, they're all over the place. So I thought, okay, so, you know, um, Home Depot has bricks for 41 cents. Now they're 62 cents. I tried different types of bricks. Um, at one point, I wanted to laser, have the books lasered, and I looked into the cost of that. But as a painter, um, I, I got stencils, and I tried different types of paint and different ways of weathering, and I can do them myself. Um, and so that's what I decided I would do for now. Um, and it's just, and now I'm, I'm, I'm figuring out how to make a, a public monument. Um, and it might be made out of bricks, or it might be made out of metal. I'm actually researching that now, somewhere in Bayfront Park. Fantastic. Everyone. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> One more question. Rosa, have you had communication with any of the families of the victims whose names you commemorated? So I get asked this question a lot um, about approaching the family. And this is something that I've thought about a lot. And this is not something that I'm I do or I'm interested in doing. The families know what's happened. And the families are, when you read, when the families are, are involved, you see um, through the conversations in the newspaper, in the media, the tremendous weight and struggle that they go through when one of their family members has been killed. When a mother whose son has, uh, who's bipolar calls the police and um, for help and the police kills her son at three o'clock in the morning in her front yard. So I, I, I am not, the families are involved in their, in their struggle. And so the way I'm interested in getting information and making it as, a, as factual and as human as I can and bring this conversation to people who are not aware of it, who are not looking at this so my job is different. And if I intersect 
and like Trayvon's um, family, mother and father have been down here in Florida, to Miami to speak at the book fair. And I listen, I read the book, I I look at the films, I do the research, but um, but I'm not, my role, I see my role as a, as a different one. Okay, well, we're running out of time. So I have one question from me. I am, I, I love art and activism. It's one of my, I think they go hand in hand. I think it's a really important part of art that we should be sharing ideas with people and opening their minds. And so I'm very interested in the Gorilla Girls. So I'm wondering if you have any idea on who one of the Gorilla Girls may be. You mean like to like the, who we can like if you were going to nominate folks to be Gorilla Girls? Is that what you mean? Oh, or, yeah, it could be that. Or if you know of anyone who actually is a Gorilla Girl, like I've always been trying to uncover who they are. But I'm sure there's some really good people that need to be Gorilla Girls. Yeah. For you. you know, um, I follow. I followed their work. Um, you know, they've been active since the '80s, and they've done uh, different. I think it's it's fabulous um, when artists are able to do the work that that they do. Um, but I have no idea. I think it takes a lot of guts, especially you know, '80s and '90s. But now, a lot of people, and I think it's wonderful, are in the United States because artists in other parts of the world. You know, Ai Weiwei, to name one that everyone knows, but there are many artists around the world who approach their their practice and talk about issues that they're interested in or they they are important to them, social issues. In the United States, that's not very common, and I think now we're seeing a little bit of uh, people turning towards using art to talk about these things. But uh, so no, I think they were fabulous. They were um, they're great and creative and innovative and they were fresh and they're new and they were doing this when other people weren't but no um i don't know okay i thought i just ask i have one comment from facebook it says i've been thinking about your project in light of the recent protests hoping the increased intention helps to amplify your work and open up new opportunities yes so first of all, I want to say thank you so much um, for sharing your practice with us and agreeing to participate in our live art talks. Um, I'm going to open up. I'm going to unmute everyone so we can say hi if everybody would like to say hi to you. And then also I have a, a, a quick poll that I would ask everyone to complete uh, before they log off. And again, thank you so much for thank you. Um, giving such a great presentation. <laughs> Alex Pierre. Hello, everyone. Hey, job, Rosa. Hey, job, Rosa. Oh, oh Alex. Great. Hi, Alex. Hi, Hi Alex. Rosie. Hi. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Rosa. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. We have very, 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 And like another person said, Queen, Queen Mary. They were like, So we're next week. We have um, Valerie Patterson here. Uh, doing her presentation at 5 30 so i just want to invite you all to participate in that and hopefully see you all then and again i'd like to just thank rosa for a great presentation and sharing her practice about um black lives matter and her commemoration on that so have a good night and everyone please wear your mask when you go out and be respectful of other people and um stay safe thank you bye